Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining us for this online webinar. Um, I hope the weather's been a little bit better wherever you are. It's starting to look like summer here in Brooklyn, New York, um, which is really exciting. You know, my favorite time of the year, whether you're hailing in from uh, another area of the United States or around the world, I think it's just great. Um, you're gonna learn a lot in this webinar. We're gonna be covering personal fundraising, nonprofit fundraising, charity fundraising, just a lot of key topics that if you are looking to run a fundraising campaign or you're currently running one, it's gonna be really vital information. I'm going to be breaking it up into two parts. So around the 30 minute mark, we're going to give some time for questions. You guys have a, a personal question about one of your own campaigns or just online crowdfunding in general. Um, so we're, that's how we're going to divide up the webinar. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about Dana and Deposit a Gift. And these guys, there are a lot of crowdfunding platforms out there, a lot of online fundraising platforms. And these guys have been really amazing about cultivating a community around their platform. They've been really good about the education aspect. They help you know, one-on-one -on -one with uh, people that are looking to do an online fundraising campaign. And they've just learned so much, I think. Um, I've taken a lot away from talking with Dana about the fundraising process. And uh, that, I, I'm just really excited for us to get to this content here. And uh, if you would like to also, you're want, you know, hungry for more information, we have a new podcast out there. Um, it's the crowdcrux.com slash fundraising podcast. And uh, you'll be able to um, see the first episode we have up in there. And uh, Dana is going to be here in just a second. Um, no worries about losing Dana. Um, but the, before, the, the one other thing I want to say before we get started here is that I think that fundraising is it's one of the great um, things that's changing in this you know online social media driven world. We're having you know Facebook, there's Pinterest, there's Tumblr, there's Instagram, um, on the there's Snapchat on the newer side, and people are spending more and more of their time on these social sites. And we're starting to see amazing online fundraising successes, whether that's campaigns raising thousands of dollars from Reddit, campaigns going viral in the media. And we're going to be setting a little bit of the expectations here. What is you know reasonable to raise from the crowd? And also, is it possible to raise, um, I'd say, in these sort of exponential categories, um, is, is it possible to get media attention? Is it possible to get attention in your local town for a fundraising campaign? We're going to be covering all of those topics. So that being said, I'm going to ping uh, Dana here, and we're going to get started with this webinar. And like I said, I think you guys have going to have a lot of get a lot of things out of it. Feel free to leave any questions as well in that uh, the comment box there. Um, we can get to that in the 30, uh, the 30 minute line. Okay. Uh, Dana, I think we're ready for uh, your segment here. Hi, everyone. I'm here. I just actually closed mine because I realized that uh, something with the connection was making um, sound kind of go in and out, so I didn't want to take away from what he was doing. Um, but thank you, Sal, for your kind words about the I'll, I'll gift. Be and definitely. And I'll just be uh, closing out my broadcasting box right now just to give Dana the full floor here and also to make sure that the connection is great for everyone listening. Um, again, feel free to leave a comment in that box there, and we'll get to it at the 30-minute mark. Thank you, guys, and enjoy the webinar. Hi everyone, this is Dana with Deposit a Gift. I'm seeing some notes in the bottom box here. So just to clarify in case for whatever reason things were, um, our voices were overlapping. Can you hear me now? That's question number one. Someone type in the box and just let us know. Okay, fantastic. So um, just to, if you're hearing it faintly, you may need to turn up the volume on your own computer. Sal is gone. Only his video is gone, meaning he's not broadcasting, but he is here with us. What we realized is that with both of us, as you're talking heads, it was causing um, a visual disruption. And you weren't able to hear him very well. So that's why I turned off my video when he was talking, and he's turned off his video when I'm talking. If your sound is cracking or you might be having anything, for the most part, it might be your internet connection because now that it's just me, everything should be fine. Bad sound from me as well. Okay, I'm going to turn off the broadcast for one second and I will put it back on because I want to make sure that before we jump into all this that you can hear well.
Okay, guys, I restarted my broadcast. Can you hear me well? We've got a lot of good information. I don't want anything to be compromised. All right, some people are saying yes and some people are saying no, so I'm going to go with the majority that it's okay. Um, it may be your internet connection or your speaker, so just turn it up. Um, and we will follow up with a, a copy of this recording, and we will follow up with a copy of the slides. Is that better? I'm adjusting the microphone. Worse. Okay. Is that better? Still static. All right, I'm going to unplug and replug back in real quick. Test, test, test. Better or worse? Okay. Enough people are saying it's fine. All right, so here we go. Um, we have an awesome webinar for you today. Super excited, and I'm so appreciative of uh, Sal at crowdcrux.com. Um, really excited to be partnering with them on this webinar. It's the first time they're doing anything specifically catering to the charity and personal fundraising world, right? So a lot of us, you know, crowdfunding has sort of been made uh, more, you know, visible and popular um, by the Kickstarters of the world for creative and entrepreneurial projects. But what you may not know, or maybe you do, is that the world of personal and charitable fundraising is actually a much bigger piece of the pie, right? Um, although it may be a little less sexy, um, and you may not hear as many stories about it in the media, I do think that's starting to change. Um, and so what I find is, and, and Sal does too, which is why we are bringing this webinar to you, is that people want to know, how do you crack the code on this, right? Like... How do you make a campaign that actually goes, that people give to? And that's what we're here to do today. So I do a lot of these different kinds of workshops. Sometimes I do it more as a 101, um, talking to people who don't know a lot about crowdfunding. We're going under the assumption today that you guys know a little bit about crowdfunding. You know what it is. You know how it works. You might have a campaign in progress uh, with another platform that we hope you consider us at some point. Um, you may be about to do a campaign and hopefully will be on your radar. You may have done a campaign in the past that didn't work well and you're wondering why because you want to try again. That's really smart um, because the reality is, is that the way people raise money today has fundamentally changed, right? The passing of the hat is going away and it's not very effective. You can reach a lot more people and reach, raise a lot more money by using uh, an online crowdfunding platform. Um, Sal is asking me to turn up my volume. Can you hear me better now? Is the volume better now? Yes? Okay. So the point of today is to answer some questions for you. And just to set some expectations, because this is a lot of information to get through, um, we are going to try and, you know, keep this as interactive as possible. Um, at the 30-minute mark, we are going to take questions. The easiest thing to do is for you to either be typing them in the box um, and then we'll get to them at the 30 minute mark, so let's say at like 1.45 Eastern, or write them down and you can ask. And then we're going to take questions at the end. I will try to do as many questions as possible in the middle. If I feel like I'm going to be answering that in a little bit or it's getting you know off topic or too specific to a particular campaign, we might table it and we can do a separate conversation. Um, but overall, the objective here is for you to actually be able to walk away and be able to implement a campaign immediately that people actually give to. So we're, the only basic thing we're probably going to go over is just sort of that sifting process about how to choose a platform. But then we're going to dive right into keys to a successful campaign, you know, how to get people to donate, spread the word, 
et cetera. And really, the answer to the question, why isn't anyone giving, if that's a challenge that you are facing or have faced or want to make sure that you do not face, right? That's the key here. Crowdfunding is all about marketing. You should write that down and accept that fact, especially if, if marketing's not your thing. It is all about marketing. Um, and so today is going to be a deep dive into strategies and tactics for planning a campaign and marketing a campaign. All right? With me? Let's get started. You're all here today because you're passionate about something, right? It may be your nonprofit. It may be a personal cause, a loved one, a business you're working on. Crowdfunding is an amazing tool to raise money for what matters to you. And it's a creative creative tool. It's a tool of creativity. So gone are the days of, you know, oh, just a donate button, right, or a PayPal button that feels transactional. You have an opportunity to engage people in your journey, right, and get them to not only give but also to share. The key is you can't just put it up and pray. That might sound a little bit cheeky, it might even sound uh, even cheekier that we're saying the internet's gonna, uh, not going to shower you with money. But the reality is, is I can't tell you, both for us at Deposit of Customer Service, as well as I know Sal gets hit up with this question all the time at CrowdCrux, so many people send in questions saying, I put up a campaign, I published it, why isn't anyone giving? The fault there probably lies a little bit in the, in the media right and the few campaigns that go you know viral and crazy around the world which are the exception not the rule so people start thinking that they just have to make the site maybe not even put that much effort into making it publish it maybe post it to facebook once and then people are just going to start giving you money it's really important that from this point forward that you understand and accept that that is not how it works Crowdfunding is a really cool tool because it is a low-cost, low-risk way to put yourself out there and raise money. Here's what the cost is. The cost is in your elbow grease. The cost is in your effort, right? Crowdfunding campaigns should not be looked at as a Hail Mary, a last-minute ditch effort, and you just kind of throw it up and see what happens. If you do that, 99% of the time, it's not going to achieve the success that you want, right? The good news is that this is not rocket science. Everyone can do this. And today's webinar is all about teaching you those steps and secrets so that you can make it happen too. So really excited. First thing that Sal and I really wanted to do was to set some realistic expectations. I would say that this top 10 list covers off on the 10 most sort of key things that you should sort of accept and understand about crowdfunding. And just so you know, there, you know, there is a lot of information here. You're going to get the, the deck at the end. We'll follow up with you via email. So you will be able to read this over and over as many times as you want. We'll also send you a recording of the link. Um, so you'll be able to watch it again. But take good notes on the, the things, the key things that stand out. Number one, you need a story that makes people care and share. But the story is not enough. Crowdfunding is about marketing. You know, one thing that we hear a lot, and I know Sal says that people write to him about this all the time, is that people don't want to market to their social networks. They feel uh, reticent. Um, a lot of times they feel like it's begging. If you're going to do a crowdfunding campaign, you got to turn that on its head. It's not begging. It could be if it's not set up the right way. We're going to teach you how to tell the right story, right? You have to give people a reason to give. You've got to make them care. You've got to make them want to share, right? I think a big thing is, you know, putting up a campaign and asking someone to clean up your mess or pay for your debts, that would be the ex example of the kind of campaign that's not going to go well. Probably not going to work any way you do it, right? So that could be considered begging, but it's also just not a good story, right? We'll talk about what campaigns are good campaigns to do or how you can position a campaign well, but it's really important that if you're going to do this, you're going to be planning to market the heck out of this to everyone you know, your entire network. 
which leads me to point three. You do need to have a network to market to, right? Sometimes even having a small network is okay because if those people really have your back and you can mobilize them, they're going to help you get to their friends' friends, right? I mean, that's the whole key of crowdfunding. It's the power of the crowd. It's looking at your network almost like concentric circles of a bullseye, right? You're going to start with that inner circle of key advocates who really love you, right? Then you're going to reach out to the next layer of people, maybe superficial Facebook friends, maybe work colleagues. From there, it's all about turning those initial supporters into advocates, getting them to share your story with their friends and to get them to give. And this applies, pretty much everything we're going to talk about today applies for both personal campaigns and nonprofit campaigns. Um, the only time that some of these rules can be bent a little around, let's say, like the pre-planning would be an emergency situation, a car accident, an illness, a memorial fund. You're going to still need to do all of the marketing, but you may not have to do as much of the planning because it carries with it a, an inherent sense of urgency. Um, but be ready to leverage your network any which way. You also want to recognize that you're going to be connected to the majority of your supporters initially, right? That's one of the big sort of misconceptions is that people think of the crowd and crowdfunding. And when you hear all these crazy stories in the media about strangers giving to your campaign, people sort of have shifted their focus and, and they stop thinking about all the people they have access to. And they just think about all the random people around the world that they want to get to give. The majority of campaigns, no matter what platform you choose, you will be connected to the people who give. And then the goal is to get those people to get their friends to give. And then there are some strategies to get you know, random people to give, but that's not where you're going to want to put your focus. Um, and, and so it's good to know that because it's actually really empowering to know, you know when you've got limited time and limited energy, right? where do you put your resources, right? And you're going to do that starting with your network. If you want to reach beyond your network, it's going to take a strategy. And a big part of that strategy, whether it's that in those initial people or the outer network, is going to be personal relationships, right? So people mistake the crowd in crowdfunding, and they think of crowdfunding as only this sort of mass messaging, like I'm just putting information out into the ether. The reality is, no matter if it's in business or crowdfunding or whatever it might be, people do things for people that they like, right? People do things for people they have relationships with. So it might surprise you to find out that some of your best marketing tactics literally might be, you know, calling up someone on the phone and saying, hey, I'm going to need your help to push this out, right? If I send you an email, will you send it to all your friends? But you got their initial support by calling one person and making that phone call, right? So the key is really that when people feel like something is written for the masses, it's not written for them, they just click delete, they ignore it. It's called the bystander effect, right? The bystander effect means, oh, this is for everyone. Oh, well, someone else will deal with it, right? So you really want to leverage those personal relationships. Um, and then also you can't do it alone. So you might be the main person running your campaign, right? You might be the point person at your organization. You might be the only person who's running it. But the idea is that you're going to want to try and get an online street team, right? So that's going to be looking for sort of key advocates who care about what you're doing. And, and I'll say, yeah, I'll help you push this out. I'll tweet about this for you. I'll Facebook about it. I'll, you know, send some emails. Um, and that way you sort of think of yourself as the conductor of the orchestra, right? And then you sort of create your band of musicians. We're going to talk a lot about having a soft launch, right? So you're not going to just put it out there with a zero balance. You actually, there's a strategy for how you launch campaigns. Some of you might know that, some of you might not, but, you know, all, a lot of campaigns that you hear, like, oh, they broke their goal within, you know, 10 minutes of being live, you should know how controlled and contrived and planned those activities were. So people will say, okay, I'm going to launch on this day. They pre-line up supporters. This happens more for, like, uh, business and creative and entrepreneurial campaigns, you should absolutely apply the same thinking, though, to nonprofit campaigns and personal ones. So you get certain people to say, yeah, I'll donate, and I'll donate exactly when you want me to. You publish the campaign. You send an email to those, you know, 10 people who promised or whatever it might be. You get them to donate first, and then you announce to the masses. And then you can make 
you know, have great news to share. Like, look how much we raise in just, you know, 10 minutes of being live or 24 hours, right? I think it's really important that you recognize that those things are not an accident. And then hand in hand with not being shy about marketing to your network is the fact that you've got to do it with a massive amount of frequency. And lastly, don't expect people to share unprompted. So I think people kind of think in this age of social media that, oh, well, they'll give, and then of course they're going to like post it to their Facebook page, you know. Some people will, and all of, you know, all of our platforms have the social media buttons built in, but if you really want to turn someone into an advocate, right, we're going to talk about what I call the continuum, starting with maybe a lurker, who's someone who's like paying attention to what you're doing, to being a supporter, which means they gave you their money, to being an advocate, which means they are now singing your praises from the rooftops, right? Most people will not do that in force without being asked. The main thing to recognize is that a good crowdfunding campaign is kind of like getting a good manicure, or if you're not into manicures, uh, like painting a wall, right? So if you notice when you get a manicure, they spend like 45 minutes, you know, primping your nail. When they actually put the polish on, it's like you know, two seconds. But if they didn't do a good job in the preparation, your manicure is going to look like garbage. And the same thing applies to painting a wall. Like the preparation might take longer, but if you don't scrape and prep and plan and think about how you're going to do the layers, right, when you go to put it on, it's a mess. Same thing's going to happen with your campaign. So I can't stress enough how much the planning phase of a campaign can set you up for success. If you've got a plan, if you've got it in writing, if you create some tools for yourself, like scripts and things like that, an online street team, when it comes time to execute, it's not so overwhelming, right? And that's what happens as people start to get dizzy and not know what to do. So you want to plan. Know what you're getting into. So here are some of the, the top myths around crowdfunding. Our job here is to make sure that these myths don't bring you down, okay? So number one, people are not just trolling the, well, I'm going to kind of combine these, so it won't be one, two, three, four, five, but people are not just trolling the internet to give you money, right? That is not true, okay? The only site that's become like a marketplace, it's not even so much crowdfunding anymore, people go shopping there, is Kickstarter, right? Any other site you choose, it is not about the site. Some sites will feature you on the home page. No site is going to feature you until you've done the legwork yourself, right? So we get emailed all the time asking to be featured. No site's going to put you up when your campaign hasn't really raised anything because it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't behoove them, doesn't make them look good, right? So the reality is, is that if a site puts their weight behind your campaign, it means you're already doing something right. So don't depend on the site. And if any site sort of sells you that basket of eggs that, um, you know, use us because you're going to get all of this exposure, it's not true. Uh, you can Google the internet. There's a lot of disgruntled people out there who made their choice thinking like, oh, I should go with a certain brand of site because that's going to give me more cachet. What's going to get your thermometer to rise is your own strategy and work, plain and simple. Your social network and your online connections are extremely important. If you don't have that set up, it may be that you're going to spend a little time before you launch your campaign cultivating relationships, reconnecting with people, making friends on the internet, you know, with, you know, bloggers and Twitter people who care about what you care about. And know that how that presentation matters. The image, the video if you choose one, how you lay out your text, the credibility that you bring to it is going to make a big difference because you have about three to five seconds to get people's attention when they land on your page, right? So you want to make it really easy for someone to get engaged and want to give and then also if they had such a good experience, they're more likely to share. So let's get started with the basics. I said I'm not going to go into like what is crowdfunding, you know, that basic stuff. But one basic thing that I, you know, 
Sal and I both get questions about, um, well, he probably more than me, is you know what platform to choose. Obviously, we are a platform. Um, most of this stuff you know. I think that you know the big thing is that there's a lot of, obviously, we're not the only game in town. There are a lot of sites out there, um, and people get confused, right? There's a lot of sifting going on, kind of what should I be picking? Um, number one is really this whole idea of flexible funding or all or nothing, right? So all or nothing is what Kickstarter made popular where you don't get to keep your money unless you meet or exceed your goal. Um, Indiegogo operates like that. A lot of the other sites are, are flexible. We're a flexible funding site. It means you get to keep your money no matter what. Some sites are going to charge you more for the privilege of keeping your money through that flexibility so you want to be aware of the fees and just you know take a look around at what else um, the differences in the sites right so you want to things to kind of look at would be the cash out process right so you might be using the site for an event that you're doing if you're using a site that um, is going to not let you have your money until after the campaign Right, and you want to be able to cash out during the campaign, that might not work for you. Uh, you may not want a site that puts a deadline on your campaign, right? Sense of urgency is important, but you don't. You may not want the site to tell you when they're going to shut your campaign down. Um, and you're also going to want to look at fees. Um, I would say that you know most sites. Uh, their platform fee, which is how crowdfunding sites make money, um, are between 5 and 9%. And then everyone has a credit card fee. Deposit gift actually has the lowest fees out there. Our platform fee um, starts at 4% and then actually goes down as low as 2% and then the credit card. So with us, you're either paying 5.5%, 6.5%, or 7.5%, depending on the plan you choose. Most other sites, it's going to be between 8.5% and 12.5%. Um, so just be aware of that and sort of what you're getting. Um, I'd also encourage you, you know, email their support and see, you know, how helpful they are, how quickly they respond, um, because crowdfunding by its very nature is very DIY. That's probably another surprise to a lot of people. It's very do-it-yourself, right? And so a lot of people are sort of left to flail, and that's why a lot of these campaigns fail, because people don't realize you know, what it takes to set up the site in a way that looks really nice, reads well, feels actionable, um, and then they don't know how to market it. I can tell you that with depositing if we offer really hands-on customer service, you know, and our fees are lower. Um, the main thing is you just want to know that the campaign is all about you. It's all about your effort. So don't make a site selection based on thinking that the site's going to do it for you. Um, meaning market it for you or give you access to their audience because for the most part they will not. Um, that's going to be your job. So what do the most successful campaigns have in common? Clear goals and objectives. They explain why the cause is important and how the money will be used, right? Because people want to feel good about what they're giving to. What else is important? Two key planning tools. One, you've got a marketing roadmap, meaning you actually took the time to write down and say, okay, the duration of the campaign is going to be this many weeks. And this one, you know, this is what I want to do this week. This is what I want to do that week. You've got to give yourself a map for how you're going to get from A to Z. If you are planning to wing it, it's not going to work as well. This is in the case for most nonprofit campaigns and most charitable campaigns. Again, for campaigns that are more like emergency relief, the plan, I would, I would sell you, tell you that you can be much more flexible. Those kind of campaigns, can you can put them up in five minutes and literally start blasting out. The main thing with those kind of emergency personal campaigns are its frequency. Lots of emails, lots of postings, lots of text messages, whatever you need to do to get it in front of people. And then a really important thing that I think a lot of people don't know is having an appreciation strategy, right? For nonprofits, this is kind of a new thing because most nonprofits wait until the end of a campaign to acknowledge and say thank you. And for individuals, some people are just better at showing appreciation than others. But here's what I'll tell you is that appreciation is actually a marketing tool, 
right? So you want to say thank you within 24 to 48 hours. And in doing that, what you're really doing is A, curbing buyer's remorse. You're making someone feel good about, um, about their contribution. But you're also saying, hey, you just did the hard part. You parted with your money. Can I ask you a small favor? Will you share this campaign? Here are some easy ways to do that. So that's appreciation number one, but it doesn't stop there. You're going to follow up with them a few more times and thank them, give them an update. Maybe you'll write a script for them to forward to their friends. And these are personal thank yous that's separate from your mass communication. It might sound a lot like a lot of work, but if you prep it and you have like scripts that you can copy paste and just personalize, it makes it really easy and it's incredibly effective, incredibly effective. So what does it look like to set up a site well, right? Personal and engaging story shows the need and impact, right? So this is sort of like the first two bullets on this checklist we just looked at. You also want to show that you're trying to solve a real problem or, you know, giving something aspirational that you're trying to achieve. And you also want it to feel credible and driven by the most effective advocate. So for example, um, when it's a nonprofit campaign, maybe you want, even though maybe a junior person is running the campaign, you want to sign it from the executive director because it's a more credible person. Um, and even for thank you notes, right, you might set up a way to hack their email so that you can send the thank yous from the senior level person. Um, if it's a personal campaign, I would say like seven, eight times out of ten, it's much better to have a third party raising money for you, right? So um, let's say your child has an illness that you or your family needs money for, you're better off if the campaign looks like it was created by a friend, even if you set it up, maybe you have a friend who pushes it out for you so that you're not the one asking. And I think that also will really help with this feeling of discomfort that people have around feeling like they're begging to their network, right? The reality is, is that people can't give if they don't know about it. People won't give if they're not asked, but it does matter who the person is who is um, requesting and promoting it. So think about who would be most effective. So a couple slides ago, you had four points um, on what, would, what comprises a successful campaign. Now I'm going to just focus on that, uh, those first two when you're setting up the site. Consider this slide like your checklist. And you guys are going to get a copy of the slides at the end, so don't worry. Um, this is like your checklist slide. And so you're going to ask yourself, you know, does it have engaging visuals? Definitely a picture. You've got to put a face on what you're doing. And a video may or may not be important. It is um, often very important for um, entrepreneurial and creative projects because you're asking people to give you money to create something. But you don't always have to do a video for a personal campaign. Sometimes it adds something. It just depends on the situation. You want to make sure from a credibility perspective and just being easy to read and use that the text is well organized, that it's brief, that you're making a clear and compelling case. No typos, no bad grammar, have someone proofread it. Like, you know, there's something to be said for speed, but also you got to look like you're a together person or else who wants to give you money? Um, I don't know if every site lets you do this. Deposit a gift does. We allow you to put a suggested donation amount and we find that that affects average ticket. So again, it's all about making it really easy for people to give and go. And if the um, little contribute box is pre-populated with a number, that can make a difference. Um, and the key is really, you know, communicating a sense of urgency. So why do people need to give today and not tomorrow? That's going to be your job. You got to convince them of that. Now, some of you may be wondering about perks. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because for the most part, for personal and charity, charitable campaigns, you don't need them. But some people might want them. So if you're considering incentives, just make sure that they are easy to fulfill, that they're in line with your strategic objectives, like what you're trying to achieve. Right? So as an example, we had a school who wanted to do one perk because they were focused on trying to increase average ticket on their campaign. And so they said, okay, anyone who gave over $180 would get a tote bag. And it was just one perk versus a variety, right? 
But that was because there's, they had a very specific objective of trying to increase how much people gave. You gotta really think about what are you trying to get out of this campaign. You're trying to make the thermometer rise, but what else? Okay, make sure your perks don't bankrupt you. Make sure that they're worth the cost and really give thought to if they're necessary because most of the time, a really hearty thank you and appreciation strategy will get you what you want. So, the key thing here is you, you know, and I, we've talked about this now a little bit, but these campaigns don't just magically take off. You have to plan to create virality. That might sound contradictory because when you watch things in the media, people, it, you know, you'll hear a founder talk and they'll say, I don't know what happened. My campaign just went crazy. I will tell you, most of the time, that is a load of baloney. Don't believe it because it's going to make you feel bad, right? It's going to, it's taking away your power. Right? I know that Sal gets questions all the time like, how come all these other people's frivolous campaigns are raising thousands of dollars and mine's not? It seems so unfair. They probably had a better plan than you did. Right? That's what we're trying to help you be armed for so that you can do it too. Okay? If you remember anything, write this down. Crowdfunding is a tool to work your network. Don't focus on the strangers you don't know. If you do... If you do it right and you keep being persistent and keep going, you have a chance of hitting those people. But you've got to focus on who you know. you got to line people up in advance. Get them to donate when you want. To share when you ask them to. Give you access to influencers. What does that mean? You've got a friend with 20,000 Twitter followers. You're going to ask them to tweet for you. Right? Everyone knows like at least one person in their life who everybody listens to. Right? They say jump. They all jump. You got to get that person on your team. You want people who will advocate for you. Okay, so I want to just take a little break here before we jump into what makes a campaign successful. And uh, we've talked about successful setup and initial planning. And I would add to uh, this slide, during this setup period, and you should write this down, our team, when we're emailing with customers and we're helping them and they're setting up and we're making it beautiful and perfect and compelling, we say, this is your assignment right now. You need to make two lists. Make one list of people that you absolutely know you can count on to donate. Those are going to be the people you approach first personally, not with a mass email. You might even have to call them if it's grandma, right? And you're going to ask them if they'll be on board to donate and when you want them to donate. And that's going to be during your soft launch. The other list of people you want to write down is who do you think would be on your online street team? Meaning who's going to be part of your band of musicians? You're the conductor of the orchestra. You got to have some people who are going to help beat the drum for you, who are going to post when you ask them to, email when you ask them to, make phone calls if you ask them to, whatever it might be. Pass out flyers, stand in the street, who, you name it. Okay, two lists. Keep a little piece of scratch paper next to your computer because it takes time actually to think of who those people are to sort of search the recesses of your head and your network. So think about who can you count on to give, list one, and who can you count on to help you share. That's what you're doing from a planning perspective while you are setting up your campaign site. Okay. Um, We've got one question here, which is, how long should you run a campaign, for example, crowdfunding for a new bus? What kind of new bus? Okay, so I, you want to clarify, Danny, about your new bus. But in general, for your campaign, you know, it really kind of depends how you want to run it and what you have the bandwidth for um, in terms of a capacity perspective. So, um, you know, if you don't think you can run a campaign longer than two or three or four weeks because of timing, then that'll be your time period. If you think you can run it longer and you think you might need more time to raise it, then you'll run it longer. The key is really, what do you have the capacity for to keep up the momentum, right? Because you literally need to be posting in your social media outlets every day. You need to be sending at least one mass email update a week, maybe two, maybe three if something really awesome happens. You need to be sending personal emails. So it kind of, it depends. I mean, they often say a sweet spot is like 30 to 45 days. Maybe for like a, a, um, 
14 passenger with a wheelchair lift. Oh, you know what? We just had a great campaign like that. Um, they ran that campaign for about six to eight weeks. Um, I can, if you email me, Danny, I can send you an example of the wheelchair lift campaign that was just running. Um, okay, James Tucker says, I want to start a campaign on Wednesday, July 1st on GoFundMe. Oops. What kind of cost-effective marketing should I do prior to launch? Well, so first of all, James, I hope that you'll consider deposit a gift uh, for your campaign because we cost less than GoFundMe and we're going to give you better customer service. So that's number one. Number two, what kind of cost-effective marketing should I do prior to my launch? I don't know what type of campaign you want to run. So James, what you may want to do is um, clarify here what kind of campaign you're doing. In terms of marketing, it all is going to depend on, on your campaign. But what I would say for anyone, let's say you want to launch a campaign on July 1st, right? So that's two months from now. It's not so much about cost. In fact, I wouldn't be spending money. You've got two months to invest in your network, right? And you want to start talking about your campaign right away, right? So that's a big part of it is like, don't make this a secret. Let people know what you're doing. Um, depending on the kind of campaign, if you've got a network, let's say it's a nonprofit, maybe you use your Facebook page as a way to start getting ideas. You know, maybe you're going to offer, do a contest or offer rewards. So maybe you ask your community, you know, um, if we were to do a contest for such and such, you know, would you want to win this, 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 or this, right? Well, then all these people are going to answer. And number one, you're going to get feedback on what people actually would pay for. So that will help you know what you should do. But it's also going to create buzz around your campaign. So I think the answer to your question, I believe it was James, is that the most important thing to do for all of you before you launch your campaign is to invest in your network, right? Identify the people, those two lists I told you about, and identify the people who are going to help you, who are going to give, and who are going to share. All right, let me look through a few more of these questions, and I want, I want to make sure that we can get through everything. So, um, okay, one second, guys. The thing keeps jumping up, so I can't follow. Stop typing questions for a second if, you're, if that's okay. All right. All right. So, Danny asked, should you start with an amount already donated? So, that's the um, soft launch that we're going to be talking about. And if you do have money that people have already donated, not every site has this. Um, we do, which is an offline donation posting tool. So, let's say you've raised money offline already then you want to post that to the campaign site before you launch so that it shows all the money you raised. Um, but Danny, I think the main thing is really it's about having a soft launch, right? It's about before you go mass that you already have money in your thermometer because giving begets giving. Diana wants to know, headlines about crowdfunders being surprised by IRS. They consider personal funds income. That is something you got to talk to your accountant about. So no crowdfunding site is going to give you guidance regarding taxes and stuff because that's not a smart thing for us to do, right? Every campaign and every situation is different in how things are considered, whether they're gifts or not. You have to have an accountant and you have to make sure you're talking to the right people, especially if you're going to be raising really, really large amounts of money or, you know, whatever the different financial implications are. I'm not trying to be vague or skirt the question. The reality is the smart thing for you to do is talk to your accountant. Um, Stanley says, as you mentioned about myths earlier in the presentation, I wonder if you could help us clear up some myths about crowdfunding platforms and the SEC regulations regarding this in general for event crowdfunding, crowdfunding for business, and nonprofits. Um, let's see if you got more clarity on that, Stanley. Um, Stanley, I'm not sure all of the questions you're asking, but here's what I would say. The business stuff and all the SEC things around the Jobs Act is completely separate from what we're talking about today, right? So we are talking about donation-based fundraising and the stuff that has to do with um, the investor kind of fundraising, the equity, um, the equity crowdfunding, um, and things for businesses are separate. And so, and actually, I'm not the best authority on that, right? So Deposit a Gift is a crowdfunding platform for 
personal and organizational fundraising. Um, some businesses do use us to raise money, let's say for business, uh, like expansions of their restaurant, to launch an app, to move locations, but from like, we're not done for equity, so I don't wanna steer you wrong. The myths that I talked about were to help you guys be able to launch better and market smarter instead of the main thing is really that people just expect once they put it out there that you're just going to get instant donations and what we really want to get across is, is that it requires a plan so that question before of like you know if i'm planning to launch july 1st and it's you know april 30th what should i do between now and then to make the best use of my time that's really where our focus is here is all the planning and building your network and coming up with a, a smart strategy okay so Paul's asking, in order to build your two list, do you suggest to ask people by sending them a draft of the campaign unless you can talk to them directly? Um, you know what? I think it depends. This, the soft launch period, I, I wouldn't send a draft of your campaign to everybody, right? You want to just share it with a few trusted advisors. Like, who do you think is really smart? Who do you think is a good writer? Who do you think would give you honest feedback? Because the, the idea is that when someone receives your campaign, you want to have a really clear header a strong image and a short blurb or at least if you're going to write a lot of text about what you're doing that the first like five sentences tell you everything that you need to know and have a strong call to action because a lot of people aren't going to read beyond even the first two or three sentences so if you share a draft of your campaign with anyone make sure it's the type of people who are going to help you make it really um, as strong as it can be and also, if you think that there's someone who's going to want to see the campaign before they tell you if they'll give you money, then yeah, share it with them. But a lot of times it's just you can let them know, hey, I'm going to be doing this. I want to know if I can count on your support. This is what it's about. Because also, if you can't explain it briefly, verbally, you're not going to be able to put it on paper. Ajaz wants to know what amounts are realistic. Is $100,000 too crazy to expect? Duration 30 to 60 days. Hey, Jaws, I need to know what kind of campaign you're trying to raise $100,000 for. I'll give you an example. We've got a memorial fund going on on our site right now. Actually, um, it's the son of the CEO of a, of a big um, fashion company who tragically died. And they are using the, the site as a memorial fund so that people, you know, can donate and remember him in a constructive way instead of, you know, wasting money. And what they're doing is they're raising money to... Um, restore and rehabilitate an aquarium and their goal is two hundred fifty thousand dollars and they're almost there and it's been about a week um, it really kind of depends on what your campaign is about what's the story this one is incredibly emotional and gripping and also what does your network look like right so these people happen to have access to a lot of high net worth people um, who give large amounts of money you might have a big network, but people who are going to give smaller amounts of money. So you, you know, you got to think about it strategically. It also kind of depends if you're doing um, raising money on a topic that maybe appeals to a niche market. Well, then that might help you have access to bloggers who talk about it, or to you know people who talk about these things on Twitter. If you can get some of the sort of high-profile people in the social sphere to um, get on board with what, and champion your cause then they might tell people about it. So it kind of depends. All right, guys, I'm going to jump through these questions a little, and then we got to keep moving through the presentation. Um, so let me just look through here. Um, and just if you guys could stop typing questions, that would help me out. OK. Um, Nadine says, I'm being approached by many sources to pay them to promote my campaign. Oh, good question, Nadine. Um, guys, if you guys could stop typing questions, that would really help me. So. Nadine saying people are approaching her to um, promote her campaign. She's on day 13. She's not prepared to help you. I'll just tell you this right now. Don't pay people to help you. Like, for the most part, unless you're a big nonprofit that's got a budget for marketing and things like that, which most people are using crowdfunding because, like I said in the beginning, it is a low-cost, low-risk way to raise a lot of money. The cost is your work. It's your elbow grease. Unfortunately, a uh, cottage industry has sprung up around crowdfunding with a lot of businesses uh, preying on people like yourselves trying to do campaigns and trying to get you to give them money to market it for you. Don't do it. It is a waste of your money. You're trying to raise money. You don't want to spend money on that. There are isolated incidences where maybe doing some kind of advertising will make sense, but 
the reality is is that a quality campaign is authentic, right? It's coming from your voice. And if your campaign's not taking off, then you need to reevaluate what your story is or if you did the right work with your network, right? You can do this. Don't don't pay people who are taking advantage. Okay, let me um, just kind of keep jumping through here, guys, because I really want to keep going. Um, Jane King says, if your campaign includes ticket sales, how can we get people to buy tickets rather than right before the event? Um, so Deposit a Gift actually is the only site, the only crowdfunding site that has a ticket sales functionality, something unique about our crowdfunding platform. Um, Ticket sales are a really great way to do what I call opening up the virtual doors on your event. In fact, that's what we talked about in yesterday's newsletter. Happy to share a copy with you guys. Um, and the idea is that you want to use that so that you can actually market your event to a larger audience and not just the people who you think might come to the event. So you're putting it out there and it allows you to, it's just a mind shift, but it's opening your focus so that you're not just talking about selling the tickets, but you're saying, hey, if you can come, fantastic, buy your tickets. And if you can't, this year you can still offer your support. Click here to donate now. Be a sponsor. Maybe you're using our site to sell the raffle tickets. Um, you want to drive more ticket sales? You got to come up with things that create sense of urgency, right? And so that's part of strategy. Tickets or not, right? So what can create a sense of urgency? It could be a contest, right? Everyone's got to give within a certain period of time is going to get entered in to win such and such. Um, it might be a donation match. So maybe you get a, a donor who says, I'll give you $1,000 if you can raise $1,000 in 24 hours. You know, then you can announce that. Um, with tickets, you can do early bird tickets, right? You can sort of offer something extra if people buy their tickets by a certain time. Jane, I know you've got a campaign with us, so we're happy to help you with those ideas. All right, let me keep going. Danny wants to know, what do you recommend for the lowest donation amount to ask for? 25 lower or higher? The average donation amount online um, is $20. And then you should decide what you want your suggested donation amount to be based on, you know, what your goals and objectives are, what you think your network will do. If you think, like, there's an aspirational amount that you could ask for without, like, offending people. So it's going to be different for everyone, but it's pretty safe to do 20 or $25. And people can always change that number. It's just a suggestion. Patricia says, we're trying to raise money for veterans going on an ongoing basis through a nonprofit. Is it realistic to expect? You know, veterans are great. Anything to do with the military can be very emotional. What I would say, Patricia, is that I don't know enough about the story, like what you're raising money for for the veterans. And don't worry, you don't need to type it now. But send us a note and let it, let's talk about it. You know, I mean, all of these things are about a story. So if you, if you saw on that slide earlier about a personal engaging story, right? Sometimes we get so caught up in the cause that we're involved in that we don't realize that the way we're talking about our story is very broad. The more specific you can be, the more you can show if you give this, this will happen, right? Or if you can quantify something like it costs us, you know, 150 extra dollars uh, per child from the PTA to be able to afford the arts and STEM program. So we're hoping everyone gives at this level. Like if you can quantify things or if you can say, you know, we're raising money for veterans to be able to go on a field trip to, you know, the Lincoln Memorial. And when they get there, they're going to meet President Obama or whatever it might be then it's like, wow, that's really cool. I want to be a part of making that happen, right? We've got a lot of campaigns like, you know, sending kids to summer camp for nonprofits, right? So you can really see, like, you can put a face on those kids and you can say, like, it costs us this much money to put a child, you know, in, a needy child through summer camp for eight weeks. This is what we want you to give. So that's what I would say, Patricia, is like, let's fine tune your story and then I think you'll be good to go. Serge says, you're talking about, it's all about marketing, but nowhere on this page I can see the name of your company. <laughs> well, it was at the beginning, Serge, we're depositing a gift, um, and what we tried to do with this, uh, with this presentation is to make it educational and not just me, you know, telling you about depositing a gift, um, although we would love for you to use us. Okay, 
Um, and Angel says that it's an interfaith organization. Oh, you're part of the Interfaith Council from Walnut Creek. Okay, I've heard about you guys. Um, all right, so for your project, Ajaz, I think it's going to be about, um, not so much about the amount of money, but same as Patricia, it's like, what's the story? And also, what does your community look like? What does your email list look like? Things like that. So we can totally talk about that. All right. I think we're good. Let's keep moving on, people. Well, it's 2 o'clock. We're supposed to wrap by in a half an hour. We might go a little over, but let's, uh, let's see what we can do. Serge, the, our website is depositagift.com. D-E-P-O-S-I-T-A-G-I-F-T.com. We're a crowdfunding platform. All right, here we go. Thank you for asking. So what makes a campaign successful? It's all about the marketing. You've got to have a plan. What's going to get you from the beginning to the end? And how do you plot out those milestones? All right, I was reading um, a book last week that I, I, it's fantastic, actually. I'm looking at it on the table right now. It's called Be Quick But Don't Hurry. And um, it's actually written um, by a formal, former UCLA basketball player in conjunction with John Wooden. Um, and it's all about, actually, the strategies that John Wooden taught um, through his tenure as a UCLA basketball coach and how that actually applies to sort of business and life. And one thing really stuck with me, one of the chapters was called, one of the chapters was called, Failure, move the mic away from my chin. You guys hear me okay now? I don't know how that got moved. Are we okay? Okay. So one of the chapters is called, Failure to prepare is preparing to fail. And I think this goes along with the manicure uh, analogy. I really wanted to insert this in the middle of this presentation to drive this point home. Okay? And I love that someone set me up. I'm sorry, I think it was Danny. or I forget who asked the question earlier. John, maybe. Um, or James. Uh, what to do between now and July 1st if you want to launch a campaign on July 1st. You've got a plan. You've got to use now to plot it out. And like I said, that's for certain kinds of campaigns and then other campaigns you can just get it up in the moment, right? It really depends like what your network looks like and your relationships. So the marketing plan trifecta, you should know this by now. This is a recap. Advocates, consistent communication. Now it's too loud. Okay. Advocates, consistent communication, follow-up and appreciation, right? So you can't be the only one beating the drum. You've got to have people who help you. You've got to be communicating a lot, meaning you've got to be posting in social media every day. We're going to talk about how to do that in a tactful way by looking for excuses and not just always asking for money. And you've got to have good follow-up skills and appreciation skills. Those three things together are going to make you really successful. So, whoops. So there was a slide before that I said, this is your checklist for when you're doing your campaign and you can ask yourself, you know, do I have good visuals? Do I have a clear, compelling story? This is your slide that's your checklist for putting together your marketing plan. So most of us are not marketing experts. That happens to be my background, which is why I get pretty pumped up about this stuff. But most people, you guys are experts in other things. So this could feel intimidating. So I wanted to break it down so you could say to yourself, Who's my target market? Who do I have access to? Who are the key influencers that everyone listens to? And who are the people I'm going to make a, an email distribution list? What marketing vehicles do, will people respond to? So your best ROI, of course, is going to be online because you send the link. People click it and they give email social media, and really even text because it goes straight to your browser on your phone. But what else will people respond to? Do you have a mass and a one-to-one -one communication strategy? And I cannot stress enough that you really make sure that you have that one-to-one. -one. Most people think that they can skirt that. Well, why can't I just send out a bunch of mass emails? And don't CC people. Everyone hates that. BCC people, don't reveal your contacts email list. And if you can actually use a website like MailChimp.com or Constant Contact to group your emails together and make it really easy for you to communicate with people, that's better for you. But mass emails have a place, right? They're good for updates. They're good for big call-outs, big announcements. 
one-to-one -one emails where you personally thank someone, where you personally ask them to get involved, people can't ignore it. It makes an amazing difference. And then finally, have you created that promotional calendar? Literally, did you put pen to paper? Some people like to do it in Excel. I kind of like it in Word, I'm not in Word, in PowerPoint, so I can make like a slide represents each week. So you have to find the system that works for you. But the main thing is, you know, when you think about your network, you got to visualize that network potential and who you know. It's possible you might have to spend some time creating a network before you launch. Like, be honest with yourself. You know, are you someone who's not very good at keeping in touch with people? Well, then it might be that you, you know, spend two months and just start making connections on LinkedIn and Facebook and, you know, just kind of reconnecting with people, letting them know what you're up to, and then you launch. Um, if you feel like you've got a pretty solid network, right, even if it's small, but there are people who are really excited about what you're doing, you're good to go. So think of it either like the concentric circles of a bullseye, or you can think about it like the branches of a tree. This, I think, is kind of fun because, you know, even though this is all online, don't think that you're relegated to only operating online. So back to that checklist, what will people respond well to? Let's say you work at a community center, right? And people walk in and out of your building all the time. Posters might work well. Let's say you're at a school. So sending home flyers in a backpack might work well because the parents actually read them and then they go and sit down at their computer at night or do it on their phone while they're waiting in the parking lot. Um, think about what tactics will work well. Get creative, brainstorm with people. It might be that you make phone calls and you have a script ready that the moment you hang up, you send them the email, right? So it's just that you need the phone call to get their attention, then you send them the link. Um, you might say, well, we don't have a very big email list, but we've got a really big mailing list, a big snail mail list. So maybe you do a lot of promotion offline, driving people online, right? And actually you make it impossible for people to give offline and you use the crowdfunding campaign as a tool to gather email addresses. So a lot of different things you can do, but don't, don't rule out creativity and offline approaches. And keep in mind that the frequency matters, right? So these campaigns are like call and response literally and that's why you've got to be posting all the time i also would say that posting all the time conveys passion um, we had someone say you know my friend was raising money for like i don't know it was like a poetry something or other that a lot of people might ignore maybe and she said you know she posted about it so many times that on the seventh time i was like dang this girl is really passionate about what she's doing i'm gonna throw her 10 bucks or whatever she gave her so don't be afraid to keep posting. What we're going to talk about in a, me a minute is what do you post, right? So this is what this says. Don't just ask for money, right? That's going to help both from a strategic perspective, but also for mindset so that you don't feel like you're begging. What you're looking for is this, right? This down. You're looking for excuses to share. Frequent excuses. So what could those excuses be? If you haven't heard of the tag and thank method, write this down. Tag and thank is on Facebook where you can literally tag people or on Twitter and I think the other social media platforms too. So I want to thank, big shout out to so-and-so, 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 and so-and-so for their support today. We're already at 25% of our goal. Big shout out to so-and-so. They just pushed us over the 100% mark. Help us keep going, right? When you tag people, it shows up in their Facebook feed. And then other people see it and they're like, hmm, so-and-so gave, oh, maybe I should give too. Subtle social pressure. But it's also just a great excuse and you're not saying, hey everyone, it's me again, give me more money. Or my favorite, when people start to get frustrated, why isn't anyone giving to my campaign? Don't do that, right? You've got to stay positive, you're a cheerleader. Crowdfunding's funny because it's kind of like high school, which a lot of people are going to groan because they probably hated high school, but it's like it's a popularity contest, right? So your job, you write this down, your job as the organizer is to make your campaign look popular. And you can do that strategically. We're going to do that through the soft launch, which we're going to talk about more in a second, right? You're going to do that by showing appreciation because every time you can announce that someone donated, people say, oh, they gave. Um, Nadine's saying she tried to do tag and thank and didn't show up. 
if you didn't actually do the at sign and you see their name hyperlinked, it didn't work. That's how tag and think works. Um, make sure that you never post a link without saying anything. I see this a lot. People just put the link up and they don't say like, hey, I'm doing this campaign where my friend's really sick. We're trying to raise money for blah, 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 or my niece needs a wheelchair, you know, help us get there. And actually that goes for you who's running the campaign, but also sometimes your friends will just post it that way. And that's fine. You know, the, our platform actually pre-populates some text, but it's always better when there's advocacy. So for the people on your online street team or in your thank you when you're asking someone to share, it behooves you to write the blurb for them for Facebook. Actually write it so all they have to do is copy paste and then you're going to control the messaging and get them to say what you want. Other excuses to share. Create a sense of urgency, right? Run a contest. You don't, not every, it's not going to be for everyone. These, I'm spitballing ideas here, right? You got to figure out what's going to work for your campaign, but you could say you've got a certain deadline. You might say everyone who donates, even if it's just a dollar within the next 24 hours is going to get something, a personal phone call from me, a lollipop, whatever, right? What does that do? It's going to drive a flurry of donations that creates popularity. It also might get you repeat donations because if you say, I don't care what you give, even if it's a dollar, if you give now, you're going to get entered for blah, 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 right? Then someone who gave before might give again, right? Think about it. You're looking for excuses to share. Write it down. Excuses to share and get people engaged. Here's an example of an integrated marketing plan. This is a really cool campaign because this woman was responding to some hate messaging that a church in her neighborhood was putting up on their um, leaderboard, which technically they have the right to do free speech, but it's pretty offensive and it was um, upsetting a lot of the parents in the neighborhood. She used our site to first just have people donate whatever, even a dollar, but just raise their voices and say, you know, this is not what our neighborhood stands for. Well, it got a bunch of media attention, DNA info, a lot of parents. She was um, promoting it on a lot of the like parent listservs in the community. So like think about how you have access to people. Got so excited that they, you know, first of all, they aligned themselves with the local nonprofit and LGBTQ nonprofit and said, you know, anything we raise is going to go to them, even though she didn't work for them specifically. Um, and it got so much attention that they said, you know what, let's turn this into a community event. So one of the neat things about the deposit gift platform I mentioned before is that we've got a ticket sales functionality. It can actually help you morph um, an event that just starts online into an offline event or vice versa. So she turned on our ticket sales functionality, ends up creating this whole event with a movie and a panel and a raffle. So she could, she sold the tickets on our site. She t sold raffle tickets. She ran donations and sponsorships. Um, it did so well that she actually did like a second round and she knew her audience. And that's what I'm talking about when you're thinking about marketing, right? So she did crazy amounts of like Facebook and Twitter and lots of emailing, but she also hit up the local press. Um, um, and she also knew that the neighborhood that she's in is a very like interpersonal neighborhood. And so she made posters and she put them up. And, um, that night actually someone came in and gave a thousand dollars cause they'd taken a picture of her poster, um, on the wall. And so you got to know your audience and think creatively about how to do that kind of integrated plan. So how do I get people to promote my campaign? That's what a lot of you guys I know ask um, us at Deposit Gift Support and also Sal at CrowdCrux gets that question a lot. So I've said it before, I'll repeat it again. You can't be a one-man band. You got to have an online street team and you want to identify those key advocates, right? So who do you know who has influence? Who's going to help you? Who's going to help you spread the word? You want to make sure that you create messaging people can't ignore. So the question here is, how do I get people to help spread the word? Send someone a personal email and ask them to. People will not do it unprompted. Remember when we set realistic expectations at the beginning? It's been about an hour. Hopefully you're, you know, stretching and moving around a little bit and you're still with me. Last point was people won't share unprompted. Don't expect them to. You have to remind them. You've got to ask them personally. You can have a script to make it easy, but you got to leave room to put their name and say, how's it going? How are your kids? You know, saw your mom the other week, whatever it is, making them feel like it was written for them and plan for a soft launch. So what is a soft launch? 
A soft launch is a pre-launch. It's when you send the campaign to a really select group of people, and usually that's um, individuals, and you got to follow up with them a couple times and give them a deadline. So uh, at Depositing, if we actually will give you a script for you to do your soft launch, we call it Don't Let Me Launch with a Zero Balance, and it says, okay, I'm doing this campaign. I'm going to launch the masses on this date, usually just a couple days, make it a short window of time. You know, if you're planning to donate, will you donate now? Right? Because your job for campaign popularity is to create the perception of a successful campaign. People want to be on the winning team. Right? Giving begets giving. Don't think that sending it out with zero will say, oh, they're going to say, oh, they need, they need my money. I'm going to give them money. They're going to say, no, this campaign's losing. I don't want to give them my money. Right? And sometimes people say, well, what do we do if we hit our goal? Are people going to not want to give anymore? Absolutely not. You want to, A, and use that as an excuse for an announcement, celebration moment, yay, and let's keep up the momentum. We hit our goal, and this means that we can do X that we said we were going to do. Help us double it, and we can do Y, right? During your soft launch, you can also get feedback from people. You're going to get buy-in from those key advocates because if somebody feels like they're a part of the journey and kind of part of the team, they're more apt to help you spread the word. And also use this time to network more. Who do you know? This is when you're showing the campaign. So how do you do this so this is not crazy overwhelming, right? Because I, what I don't want you to do, and I know Sal doesn't either, want you to walk away feeling like, holy cow, this is so much. What, you know, how can I launch something like this? It's totally doable. Take it in steps. You're going to use this presentation I send you to break it down. Set up the site well. Start thinking about who can help you. Start mapping out how you want to promote it. Make sure your network is intact. And create yourself a little marketing toolkit, right? So that when you launch, it's really easy to send those thank you notes because it's already written, right? It's really easy to ask someone to post on Facebook for you because you already wrote the blurb. You see what I mean? It's the planning that determines the execution. So make it easy for people to share. These are just some examples, right? There's a cool tool called clicktotweet.com. You can actually pre-write the tweets for you. For, for, your, for them. And uh, they just click it and it'll tweet what you say. Write scripts. Come up with a hashtag. Orchestrate waves of sharing, right? Like if you, let's say you're doing a campaign, uh, maybe it's a personal campaign, and so a lot of the people who would be helping you promote it actually know each other. So if you say, okay, everyone's gonna, maybe it's a school, right? So, um, or close family friends or whatever. Everyone's gonna post on Tuesday at 2.30 right? Well, then all of the mutual friends' Facebook feeds will get flooded with the same message, and it's going to make it look really popular. You might create a press release, right? And there are even free press release websites. So I'm saying, like, look for free tools. You don't need to spend extra money. Put a press release on a free website, and then if you do decide to start going after the media, you have a link to send. It's very simple. Another tool for yourself is to create like what a checklist would be for a typical day because you can't let this take over your whole life. I mean, you will be busy when you're running a campaign, but you've got other stuff to do, right? So you have a checklist and that way you sit down for your crowdfunding hour or 15 minutes and you go through the checklist and you do exactly what it says. Follow up with people, send a newsletter, do a Facebook post, and then you know what you need to do. And I always recommend actually once you've gone through your checklist, why not make the checklist for the next day? So when you sit down again, you're ready to go. It's all about having systems. And the same thing with creating an email distribution list, right? So before, you're, before you launch, definitely you want to call together all of your email addresses. Um, and then during the campaign, as people donate, right, and you get new people donating, add them to your email address list, right? That way, when you have a preset list, you don't have to wonder who you emailed or that you have to re-pull the list together. You don't want to reinvent the wheel every time. I can't stress this enough. A campaign without an appreciation strategy is, can only go so far. People get really pissed if they don't get thanked, right? 
but not only that you're just missing out on a marketing opportunity so think about it this way as a campaign organizer your job is to move people along this continuum as quickly as you can from a, I call them lurkers right so people who are just kind of watching not taking action supporters they've given you money advocates advocates help you beat the drum your job is to turn supporters into advocates. That's where you're going to do your main work. Lurkers are going to more like get your mass messaging and hopefully they give because you're going to beat them down with as million emails and Facebook posts. Once they've given, that's when you start writing to them personally and asking them to share. Does that make sense? Lurkers to supporters to advocates and your job is to move them along that continuum. How do you do that, right? Put people in the mood to share with appreciation. It's amazing what a thank you can do, right? And you use that thank you as an excuse for a personal ask. You're going to leverage your new supporters to spread the word. So every time someone parts with their money, you follow up with them. And, you know, this can be done both individually and mass, reporting back on impact and progress and success. So, um, you know, you helped us raise the money for the wheelchair van, you know, we were able to put down a down payment, right? The next step is you found the van, we're at X amount, we need this much more to buy the van or reupholster the van or, you know, put in the wheelchair lift, whatever it might be. So like help people stay current with what's happening. They're going to feel more invested in your success. And what is going to help you? Right, when I talk about creating tools and systems is create a schedule, right? So that you know when and how you're supposed to follow up with people. You just cannot expect anyone to remember to share for you. Totally unrealistic, they won't do it, okay? It's your job to stay on top of people. So, and this is like one of the biggest questions everyone asks because of the hype of the media and I have addressed this a little bit. Will strangers give to my campaign, right? That seems to be the holy grail. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Maybe. But don't make that your focus. It is probably not the best use of your time. In fact, Sal and I were chatting about that yesterday in preparation because it, it seriously is one of the biggest questions. When you've got limited time and resources, think about where you want to put that energy. Do you want to put that into sort of your long shots and you're not sure you can make it happen? Or do you want to put it into the people who, like, you know, care about you and what you're doing? Right. Even if it's someone you haven't been in touch with in a while, you know, we hear all sorts of fun stories about, you know, I put this on Facebook and some of the first people to give were like friends from kindergarten that I haven't barely been in touch with. Or one guy told me the first person to donate was somebody who fired me from a job three years ago that I thought didn't even like me. And I forgot that we were friends on Facebook. Right. So start with people who, you know, this is your opportunity to squeeze the juice out of those people you have access to. I hear that a lot actually with nonprofits. Like they're all saying, oh, how do we get new donors? Because everyone obviously wants to beef up their supporter base. But then my question is, well, okay, of your email list, what percentage of people actually donate? And they'll usually say like, you know, 10, 20%. And so I say, so why are you so worried about getting new donors? You have 80% of people who have raised their hand and opted in and said, I care about what you're doing. Make me care enough to give you my money, right? Low hanging fruit, go after those people. Move them from a lurker to a supporter. Get them to give you your money and then turn them from a supporter into an advocate. Once they advocate for you, that's how you get those new people. So when you're thinking about how do I get strangers, don't go straight to try and getting strangers. It's not going to be a good use of your time. You can try, but it's not going to work well. It's probably one of the biggest reasons a lot of campaigns fail. People don't know how to work their network. Go through those rings. Move out, 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 okay? If you've got your network support, well, now what, okay? This is turning people into advocates. Get your friends to ask their friends. If you don't ask, you don't get. You have to ask people to share with their friends. Don't think they're just going to do it unless it's some crazy emergency situation. Your neighbor's house burned down and it's all over the news and everyone knows. Yeah, lots of random people are going to give. But for the most part, with most campaigns, that's not how it works. If you're ready to widen your network through cold pitching, right? These are the type of people and organizations and bloggers and social media outlets that you want to invest in to try and create relationships with. 
I will tell you this, I had to put this toward the end of the presentation because it sort of fit into the stranger category, but for most campaigns, when you're doing this whole planning period, you really want to invest in your network. But let's say you already know you've got a pretty solid network and you're prepping and your people are buying into what you want to do, then you might want to start planning for some of that bigger PR buzz because journalists, bloggers, big wigs on social media are not going to pay attention to you if you just start tagging them and emailing them like in the middle of the campaign right for the most part sometimes they might see it and say oh that's cool but for the most part personal relationships play a key role that's one of our realistic expectations from the beginning right so you relationships take a long time to build right so you want to be getting snow people showing value doing something nice for them before you ask for them right but this is, these are some tactics for widening your network through more cold, cold approaches, right? But warm leads are always going to serve you better. So we're near the end, and then we're going to take some questions. So we may go a little over for questions, but I'm happy to stick around. What types of campaigns can crowdfunding be used for? So what I did is I pulled a lot of different campaigns off of our platform deposit a gift to show you and I'm hoping you guys can see yourselves in some of these um, I broke them into a few different categories so we're gonna start with raising money for organizations and I'm just gonna flip through this you'll see it on your own um, benefits galas and tournaments so like I said we're the only crowdfunding site with the ticket sales functionality so that's what you, what's unique here um, but also these sites are there's they are focused on tickets, but so much more. They are opening up the virtual doors to their event. Annual appeals. Um, so this, I think, might go to like, um, uh, sorry, Enroz. I'm sorry, I forgot your name wrong. Is I question about sort of like a larger, longer term campaign can definitely be doable. It's really your marketing strategy. Specific needs, right? Science labs, art programs, summer camps. Um, there might be monthly events. This was a cool one. This was a, a food bank that had, they always did like a hunger awareness month, but they never asked people to give money just to sort of take action by wearing orange and giving cans of food. And they were shocked to see that they raised almost $15,000 in one month. Um, actually, they hit their goal at the two week mark. Startup nonprofits, this can work really well for, um, even if you don't have a website, you know, you can use this as a way to sort of establish your brand and what you're doing. Um, you can use it for land and building fundraisers. This is a really cool case study. This is a local swim team that um, is basically all volunteer. They've never raised any money. They thought their original goal was $2,500. This puts them, I think, at 12000 I think they're close to 13000 now. Um, and what ended up being the nut that cracked the marketing can for them was um, sending an email to all the parents every night announcing the success of the campaign and giving them a blurb to post to Facebook where they basically wrote it for them and said, my kids on the such and such swim team, will you just donate a dollar? We call it the donate a dollar campaign. Um, what happens is nobody ever just donates a dollar. They always donate usually a minimum of 20, if not more. Um, and when they started doing that with frequency and they had like this whole band of parents posting, uh, they started getting donations from all over the country and they've raised more money than they ever have. Um, Giving Tuesday, although it's in December, I would encourage a lot of you, if you work for organizations, to start thinking about sort of paving the road to Giving Tuesday and how you can use crowdfunding for that. This campaign was awesome because they beat their goal at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and called us and said, what do we do? And we said, send another email and tell people that, you know, we were just raised enough money to give X amount of seniors cell phones, help us double that, which they did. You can use it for holiday fundraising. Now, supporting the community in times of need. Uh, this is very connected to like the wheelchair van someone was asking for. Actually, this is the wheelchair van one for the love of Sophia. I think they're now closer to the 40,000 mark. Medical support, personal crises, um, personal charitable events. This is for someone who had cancer and they were actually doing like a personal benefit. So they used the ticket sales for that. Um, memorial funds immigration, refugee work, basically anything personal. And what I would say for these personal ones is that um, if it's completely emergency, you can literally just put it up and go. And it's really about frequency. If it's something you're planning for, like, you know, wheelchair accessible something or, you know, some sort of surgery, then you could um, 
then you could, you know, take a little time to plan. It kind of depends. People use it for fertility and adoption um, is a pretty big topic of conversation right now. Animal rescue. Volunteer and board fundraising is our final category. So a lot of people either are work at nonprofits who are listening and have people that they need to mobilize or you are just someone who gets inspired yourself. You can use it for special gifts and acknowledgments, political action. Uh, mission trips and service trips are really popular. A lot of people need to raise money to be able to go or help the people that are going to be there. Um, we see a lot of students and teenagers doing their own service projects. Um, you can even do it for conferences and retreats. So if you need people to, you know, all be on board with having the conference, get them to crowdfund it. Um, and a lot of times for boards, senior boards and junior boards, there's a give get and you can use crowdfunding to sort of create a little competition. The main thing here as we wrap up is that with a little elbow grease uh, and know-how, which you all have now, we really want you to feel like you can do it, right? So this should be a low-cost initiative. Don't let people try and convince you to pay for things. Invest in your network. Invest in your resources. Feel free to use, you know, the Deposit a Gift team um, and Sal uh, and we're, you know, at CrowdCrux to, to help give you ideas about what to do. So with that... Um, this is our end time at 2.30, so I know some people have to go, but I'm happy to stay on. Hopefully Sal is, and we're going to take some more questions. So I'm going to scroll up a little bit here. Um, so let's see. Is it better to, for, to Facebook people on their page, Messenger, my page, or to thank them? Um, so it depends what you're trying to do. If you're trying to make a personal request, um, if you have someone's personal email, that's always better. If you only know them through Facebook, you can send a private message. I would never make a personal request on someone's wall because you might embarrass them. Um, but then when you're in the heat of the campaign and you want to tag and thank people and sort of create buzz, then that's how you would want to you know, use Facebook in that way. Um, Paul says, my experience is that I often got more support from total strangers than from my own network of friends and families. So do not underestimate the strangers. Paul, it's totally possible, but the thing is, is you may have done a totally bang up job with how you marketed it, since we don't know anything about your campaign. What I would say is, strangers are totally doable if you know how to tap into them. It's just a matter of having that kind of savvy and access. So I'm guessing that you're really good at that. Um, and it can be an inspiration to other people, but um, most people should start with their network. And then, you know, you never know, you know, like the charity thread on Reddit can be a great way to get people interested. Look for certain hashtags on Twitter and that can be a way to start the conversation with people who care about what you're doing. So that's great. All right, we're not going to be promoting other people's campaigns during this. Um, Jane's asking, what about raising money to produce a new medical device? Ooh, that's cool. Um, I mean, honestly, you can raise money for anything. It's really a matter of, it's not so much about, okay, is it a bad idea or a good idea? Because that you never know until you test it with the market. My question for you, Jane Carruthers, would be, you know, do you have the people to market it to? Would you have people who would be interested um, if you're producing it? You know, you'd probably want to do it more as a rewards campaign because it's kind of a thing versus like, you know, karmic fundraising for something personal. Um, and so, you know, how complicated is it? Is it something that you'll be able to, you know, give people something in return? Um, is it something that's like a hot topic right now? You know, there are certain illnesses, diseases, and disabilities that are more popular in the media, right? So if um, it's kind of like with regular marketing, if you're trying to create the market, you're going to have a harder time than maybe, you know, writing the coattails of a topic that people are interested in or the media is excited about. So happy to talk to you about that. I think it really kind of depends on the specifics, but it sounds like it could be cool. Edgeoz says, what's the next step? I'm really interested. Can I call the schedule phone meeting to discuss strategy? Um, so the way it works with, um, it's kind of like you just set me up, Edgeoz. <laughs> um, if you guys are interested in using the deposit a gift platform for your crowdfunding, um, I'm going to be personally following up with each of you. Um, let me just, I'm going to give you my contact information though here. So here's my email. It's Dana at depositagift.com. That's the best way to get in touch with us. Or you can also just do support at Deposit a Gift and the team will respond. Um, don't necessarily, you know, tweet us 
for the help unless you want to just tweet that you really enjoyed this or, or Facebook it's much better to send us an email and that way you know let us know what you're interested in doing it might be something simple where we can literally just send you a cheat sheet and help you get going and and help you over email which is often most efficient if it's something where you know it really seems like it requires a conversation we're happy to talk I mean that's something that's really different about deposit a gift is high touch customer service so if you're interested either go to depositagift.com and click on the orange get started free button and just create your campaign or send us an email to support at depositagift.com and say that you were on the crowd crux webinar or email me same thing and like i said i'm going to follow up with each of you individually and send you um, a link to this recording and also to a dropbox with the presentation if you don't see it in your inbox check your spam folder um, a lot of people don't check their spam folders and so much stuff gets caught there um, and so we, we will be following up within the next you know 24 to 48 hours um, all right and so you're welcome Jane Carruthers make sure I didn't miss anyone um, Festus from Ghana says how do I create a video pitch for my fashion campaign now that's cool um, well it depends what specifically about fashion that you're doing if it's like if you're trying to create a specific item you want to sell, I'm making this up, t-shirts, pants, a fashion line. Um, I would say for something like that, yeah, you definitely would want a video and you also need to think about rewards for something like that. So that's kind of the difference. Rewards, perks are for like less karmic campaigns where it's more donation based is, you know, feel good stuff. Um, to make your video, listen, if you don't have a lot of money, use the webcam on your computer and you know, use iMovie or, you know, some basic editing programs to, you know, piece it together. You know, sometimes with fashion, it's hard because people sort of expect this, like, you know, high fashion, high end video. But, you know, especially if you're trying to raise the money, you want to be really um, smart about how you spend your money. And I wouldn't it may make sense for you to spend money on a video being produced. You know, in those situations, it might matter if the medical device very much like, you know, it's medical. So you really want to show like quality and leading with the brand. Um, it may make sense to hire someone to do a video. But, you know, if you're on a budget, there's a lot of ways that you can barter with people. Students in, in um, film school will help you out with that stuff. But that's what I would do for the video. And then all of the platforms the deposit gift platform, other platforms out there, we all have the ability for you to post your video. Usually you want to put it on YouTube or Vimeo first, and then you take the link and you embed it. Okay, Nadine says, are there specific places we can go to focus on to be in front of folks who support crowdfunding and want to support projects? Um, okay, well, there is this one website. This guy, um, Dwayne, runs a neat website called Backers Hub. Again, that's not really for the karmic projects which is the majority of what we're doing here so donation based stuff charitable stuff um, that one is really more like campaigns on Kickstarter um, but backers hub is a place to go so if you are planning to do more of like a product um, I would check out that site feel free to email him say we sent you he's a very nice guy and I think has a nice team um, but for the most part People who support crowdfunding, I mean, it's less about who supports crowdfunding and it's more about who is interested in what your campaign is about. So let's say I'm making this up. You want to do um, a cookbook about, you know, Portuguese cooking, right? Well, the neat thing is that your audience is more niche, right? So you can actually scour the internet and find who are the people who are super passionate about Portuguese cooking. Um, bloggers, people on Twitter, Instagram, and those are the kind of people you want to make friends with. But, you know, remember that personal relationships play a key role. So you don't want to just spam them and send them your link, right? Never just spam and just say, hey, give to my campaign. You want to approach them, get to know them. Maybe there's something that you can do for them. Um, you know, I always think about this kind of thing, just like networking in general, it's, it should be karmic. And you often want to try and do something for someone else before you ask them to do something for you, which is why if you don't have a strong network now, because that might not be your thing, you want to start invest in doing those things. So finding people who care about what you're into, if you want to go outside of your initial support network, you know, look for people who are writing about and tweeting about and blogging about those kinds of things. Jane King says, Deposit Gift is a great site, helpful, responsive. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Paul, for joining us. Let's see. Um, Leanne says, I created the Lifeline 
a free Canadian suicide prevention app which supports veterans. I have funded it on my own. Thus far, my support is worldwide. The strategy to crowdfund would be for both awareness and to raise funds. What kind of video, looks like your message got cut off. What kind of, I'm guessing you're asking Leanne, what kind of video would you do? Um, well, the video, I mean, it's really a marketing strategy question. So um, I think it's more about what you're doing and how you're helping people right, and why somebody's support matters, right, that's, and you got to do this in like two minutes or less when you're doing your video, it can't be long, um, so that's really what you're doing, and then the call to action is for people to donate, and I guess you need to decide if, you know, if it's an app, maybe they're getting something in return, if they give at a certain level, that's where thinking about those strategic objectives makes a difference. I'm glad that this has been helpful for you guys, does anyone else have questions, um, I know we covered a lot of stuff, so you're probably going to want to think about this and kind of absorb it a little bit. Um, it was our pleasure to arrange this. I'm going to kick it back over to Sal. I'm actually going to turn my broadcast off and let Sal turn his on um, so he can give the last word. So I'm going to wait till he pops in. Hey guys. Okay, I'm gonna stop my uh, broadcast. It's great to see you guys. Oh. Uh. Great. Uh, is this stuff here? Well guys, I hope you got a lot out of this webinar. I think it was really helpful, really insightful, a lot of information there. And uh, we're definitely gonna be sharing this link so you guys can review it. Also the slides, all that kind of stuff. I'm gonna put it on crowdcrux.com, take some notes so you can also digest the information there. The only last two things that I want to say here was that one, I think the, the tip jar aspect is really a big takeaway that a lot of these campaigns doing that soft launch pro in period is so important, so vital. And just think about it, you're going down to your local I know, hardware store, your local eatery, having a tip jar with some money in there, it just encourages people to give more. Um, so that was a really big takeaway for me. Also, the fact of seeing people in your network, not just as individuals, but people with aspirations, people who care about certain causes, people who have certain professions. Um, someone's profession might connect them with a journalist or a blogger or someone that uh, you can then leverage that connection. So it doesn't always have to be money that people are giving to your campaign. It can also be their connections or their influence in the world. That's another awesome takeaway that I had from this campaign. The last thing I want to say is I'm a really big believer of karma. Um, the amount of good, the amount of awesomeness that you bring into the world, I think will pay dividends in the future. So making sure that you're not just staying up to date with your relationships, with um, your interpersonal connections, but using this as an opportunity to connect with your community. You know, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to grow, to learn, and to, to learn about people that you might not have, you know, Consider to be acquaintances, but now you can make them really best friends. You can um, connect with them. You can check out what's going on new with them in Facebook. And then, you know, say two months down the road or three months down the road, when you're launching one of these campaigns, it's going to pay off a lot. So um, it's a great opportunity to connect with your community, connect with your family again, and uh, connect with those long lost friends you might have been really close to. But um, for now, for whatever reason, you've run out of touch a little bit. But thanks, guys. Um, again, I'll be putting this on crowdcrux.com. And if you want to continue the discussion, you can go to crowdfund, uh, crowdfundingforum.com. That's our discussion forum. It's free. You can post there in the nonprofit section. Thanks so much to Dana. Go and check out uh, Deposit a Gift. And uh, we're going to be having more education sessions like this. So definitely stay tuned.